Welcome to the Lived Experience Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Kleber, and today I've got my interview from the I Swear I Never podcast, which is a pretty popular podcast by news.com.au and Beck Day uh, interviewed me and a big thanks to Tess Lazarus for getting me the opportunity and it was, a, it was really it was a really good experience. You know, the episode goes for around 30 minutes and I was asked various questions and I tried to answer as honestly and open as I can, but nothing to hide and hopefully that comes through in the interview. And a big thanks to Beck Day uh, for taking an interest in it and um, posting this story online. It's sort of interesting hearing it from this perspective, um, listening back to, to my own story. You know, I don't like listening to my voice, as we can all imagine. But, it, you know, and you always go, well, I wish I said this, I wish I said this, I shouldn't have said this. But I tried to speak from the heart and hopefully that comes through. And hopefully, if you are a first-time listener, you can. it's a really probably a good episode to listen to, to hear a little bit about my story. And it's sort of put the wheels in motion for um, a little memoir or, or book I, w- I want to start working on. So this is almost like the chapter one, if that, that per se. I call it the moment of awareness. So hope you get a bit out of it. And if you did like it, please make sure you reach out to me via the contact form of the notes. And once again, big thank you to Tess Lazarus and Beck Day from this I Swear I Never podcast for giving me the opportunity and bringing a few new listeners into the show. I hope you enjoy the episode. And until next episode, I hope you stay safe. Just a note at the top here, this episode contains discussions of suicide and mental illness. If you need support, please give Lifeline a call on 131114. Hello and welcome back to I Swear I Never, the podcast where we talk to ordinary people who find themselves in extraordinary situations. Situations they swear they never could have predicted. Every week we have a different theme and this week's theme is responsibility. Beck spoke to Joel, a man who found himself in and out of foster care from the age of seven due to his mother's mental health issues and some failures in the system. But before we get into that, who are you? I'm Beck Day. Who are you? I'm Nina Young. How much responsibility do you feel on a day-to-day basis? I... (laughs) <laughs> just basically a barely functioning human I would I would describe myself as um people have responsibility for me I think um you know like when when, when my partner goes away for the weekend he leaves frozen food for me in the in the freezer <laughs> Because obviously the the message there is you are incapable of feeding yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you, t- you like I just feel like everyone has you know different areas where they take the responsibility. A- at home, you probably take more of a back seat. Where I would say at work, you probably you're in the responsibility seat quite a lot, which makes sense. Yeah, I think there. And anyone who's like lived with a journalist or a creative person, I think, is aware of that dichotomy where you can be like like a, a creative genius and like, oh my god, that person's so clever and can do this, and then you realise that like that does not expand to all areas of their life. <laughs> um, so yeah. my, my partner calls me uh, an idiot savant. Um, mm, mm. And also, <laughs> what's that Trump quote? He calls me a very special genius. <laughs> I love him so much. <laughs> what about you? I'm, you're, you're responsible. You've got three kids. Yeah, I'm like oldest child, anxious type, quite, I, I often, you know that song from uh, Encanto, the famous Disney movie that everyone's children is obsessed with? There's oh, a yeah. song about like pressure and yeah, like yeah. having to hold all the pressure and I, I've i never resonated so much with a Disney song. Yeah. Um, but I, but from a young age, I have felt a crushing responsibility for everybody's happiness. <laughs> it's just you know, part of my mo. But Put that I on do, a t-shirt. Yeah, yeah. I'm fun at parties. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's interesting because I think that like uh, a lot of a lot of how much responsibility you perceive yourself to have is. Um, is the way that you like to see yourself in the world, I I think. Like I think that because, it, uh, yes, you know, sometimes we can have responsibility pushed upon us, but it is a certain type of person who takes that on as their own. Hmm. Um, and I also think, like, for example, in the person that we're talking to today, Joel, is incredible. I found him incredibly inspiring. And also I found his story really heartbreaking. But his is a story where, you know, he felt the crushing weight of responsibility from 
far too young and and you know in a similar vein the authorities who should have been responsible for making sure he didn't have to pick up quite so much of that um, were absent in his story which is something that he's really passionate about trying to fix for other kids who might find themselves in a similar situation um, but yeah it really put into perspective for me the idea that you know we need to we, we need to help people who have heavier burdens in this society and we don't always do a very good job of doing that my my first question though is how much did you cry during this interview? <laughs> I actually cried like I, 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 I tried to pretend that I wasn't crying because I was like this is not about you, Beck. But uh, I felt really moved by. Um, I, I mean, it, you'll you'll hear for yourself, but it's just heartbreaking. You can't. I don't think you can listen to it and put yourself in his and his sister's position and not just feel incredibly heartbroken for the tiny little babies that they were. Well, let's get into it. Beck told this one. Take it away, Beck. Joel Kleber's earliest memories of his mum, Anne, are of a bubbly, doting mother who made sure every weekend was filled with a different adventure. So every weekend we'd we'd go to an activity. So whether it be science works or we go to Kings Park in WA or Underwater World or Hillary's Boat Harbour, you know, every weekend she was taking us to do an activity where we try and learn something. So she's always trying to teach us something and make sure um, that we did things that she didn't do when she was younger. He also remembers her being one of the most social people he'd ever met. She was always overly friendly. She made friends just randomly in the supermarket or in Maya, and they were lifelong friends up until the very end. You know, her best friend she met in Maya just one day because she went and said, oh, you look nice in those clothes. So she was a very friendly, very, very sociable person, and she was just a really, really loving and caring uh, a mother. Joel loved his mum, and he never questioned any of the things she did, even when to other people they might have seemed a little bit odd. Like the fact that sometimes his mum didn't sleep for days at a time or that she'd sometimes buy really expensive, extravagant things instead of paying the mortgage. Everything was fine in Joel and his younger sister's world until one day when he was seven years old, he got a visit at school that would change his life forever. Halfway through school, get pulled out of the um, the school to go to the principal's office and then there's a couple of police waiting there um, basically saying, you know, your mum's in hospital. And they wouldn't tell us exactly what was wrong with her, so you worry a bit. And then they basically took us in the back of a divvy van to a local human services office. And then some guy in a suit um, was basically trying to say to us, you know, you know, your mum's in not well and this sort of thing. And they wouldn't tell us exactly what was wrong with her. Um, but then eventually it was basically, you know, she has a mental illness, so a bipolar, and um, she's in a psychiatric ward, you know, locked locked unit for, for care. So that's basically how we found out in what space of, you know, a couple of hours. Um, you know, that's what I sort of learned about it. And then from that day on, you know, everything really, really sort of changed. In an instant, Joel's life went from the familiar comfort of home with his mum to being almost completely alone in the world. Joel's dad was working overseas in Saudi Arabia and, in a decision that was unfathomable to most, chose not to come home to look after his kids. With no family around in Perth to help, there was only one option left for Joel and his younger sister. Basically after that, we will pretty much the next day, literally from human services because he couldn't care for us, um, we were taken to a, to a lady's house as a, as a foster, foster home. So within one day we've gone from having a normal life, you know, with, with a mum and um, who was all fine to us. Then the next day we're in a, we're in a strange lady's house in a suburb far away, um, you know, and then no real explanation was provided to us. They just basically said she was in hospital. I don't think, I don't recall them really saying she had bipolar or anything at all. They just basically said she wasn't well and she won't be coming back for a while. I mean, you have to go to this lady's house and that was it. Joel had one day off school and then was expected to go right back the next day as if nothing had changed, when in fact nothing would ever be the same again. He was frightened, lonely and filled with dread at the idea that he might not see his mum again. And even though his new foster carer was very kind, he felt like he'd woken up in a nightmare. Oh, look, she was a nice lady, um, but, you know, you, it's not your mum and, you know, and you, you're not, you know, got no context, no nothing. Um, the lady was really, the lady was pretty nice to us, but then we just basically, you know, we, we were very shy kids. So, you know, we didn't really want to say much. We just wanted to stay in the room and be left alone. Um, but she was nice enough to us. As it turned out, Joel didn't have to wait too long to be able to see his mum. 
But it was a traumatic experience and it was one he feels he and his sister should have been protected from. Because, you know, any mum or any father would love their kids and want to see them when they're in the psychiatric ward, but it's probably not the best thing for the kids to see them in that state. So I think it was, in, it was within a week or two. We wanted to see our mum, so I didn't really know too much about it. So, you know, we were driven to a place called Greylands um, Psychiatric Ward in, in Perth. It's a large area. And basically we were taken with the social worker, provided no real context about it. Um, and then basically, you know, we just wanted to see our mum and then we were taken in to see her and she was in a gown, she was in a locked ward, um, you know, with not, when there's no extension cables, there's no sorts of things, it's under 24 sort of seven lock, lock and key. But we were taken into like a room, basically just sat in a room with her. She, I think she had some ECT um, the day before. Um, you know, so she had a bit of drool coming down her face and stuff like that. And my mum being very social, she basically took her hands and started parading us around the psychiatric ward to meet all her friends and stuff like that. And these are people who are, you know, sch- schizophrenics and, and people with who have just had ECT and stuff like that. So, you know, being forced to sort of meet all those people and, and shake their hands and sort of, you know, having a doting mum run you around a psychiatric ward, you know, it was good for her but it wasn't good for us and that's something that happened multiple times and that's happened to that's happened to a lot of other people as well don't go anywhere we're going to be right back after this short break after about three months Anne was out of treatment and back with her kids she was adamant that she'd been healed and was never going to have to leave them again well, the annoying thing for us is she'd always used to say to us kids, you know, I'm gonna, oh, I'm better now, I'll never go back in, I'll never go back in. And then 18 months to two years later, she'd do it. So for us as kids, you know, if you're a young person, you believe you're, what your mum's going to say to you and have her say to you, I'm never going to go back in that, to there again. And then two years later, 18 months, the same thing happens. And that happened all the time. It was very disappointing. Um, but that's, that's something that, you know, as I got older to learn, it wasn't her fault. Um, but as a kid, it's very hard to not blame or think your parents are a liar when they constantly say that to you and they don't manage their condition well and they go back in all the time. The next four years followed a heartbreaking pattern. Anne would go in for intensive treatment in a facility for a number of months, during which time Joel and his sister would be plunged back into the foster care system or, if they were lucky, able to stay with friends of their mums. Um, you know, and once our friends, families from school found out, some of them we'd stay at their houses for a bit as well. So, um, the, you know, the people over there, even though we didn't have any family over there, um, my mum's f- socialising was good because she made a lot of friends and stuff like that. So we had that, we had that, we had that network and that familiarity with those people. So generally, what would happen is we go to a foster home for a bit, and then if a suitable friend's family wanted to take us in, they would take us in and and go from there. It got to where Joel and his sister could predict when another episode was coming on. But like a runaway train, they were powerless to stop it from crashing into their lives. Um, my mum was bipolar 1, so she had more manic episodes. And then basically, you know, we, we knew, because we lived with her, we knew four, four to three weeks out before she eventually got made involuntary or the police were, were called or an ambulance was called because she was acting erratically to take her in. But we knew when she was getting sick and, you know, it might be spending a large amount of money, it might be staying up for a couple of nights, it might be just doing a weird and extravagant things, it might be saying things as well, um, you know, the way she spoke, um, these sorts of things. So there was all these different signs before. Basically she had an episode where eventually a lot of the time what would happen is because she never wanted to go into the, the psychiatric ward or had the foresight to check herself in and make herself involuntary, she had to get so well where basically the police were called by the neighbours and they would have seen her acting weird or something like that and that forced a call to the police and the police would come around and then the ambulance would take her away um, to the emergency room and from the emergency room she'd get assessed and then they would take her into a um, a locked ward, uh, a psychiatric ward and that happened over and over uh, throughout our life. Each time things would get to crisis point, the system would step in to treat Anne but that's not what it felt like to Joel. To Joel, it just felt like they were taking his mum away again. To me, she was my mum, so I didn't really have the foresight to understand what she was doing was was bipolar. That was just my mum, and that was just what she did. Um, you know, and when you you know you age, you know, under ten or under twelve, when this thing sort of happened, you don't really have the critical thinking to sort of go, oh, that's her mental illness playing up. There was just mum, and I knew she was going to get unwell, and but you know, I didn't want her to go anywhere. And then when the police came, um, it was embarrassing. You had neighbours coming out on the on the on the you know in the cul-de-sac and sort of looking what's going on and all the commotion and then basically you know once they saw her that happened to her once you sort of known as the person well she's got bipolar and this and that and all that sort of stigma 
So it was very embarrassing. Um, but saying that, you know, police were always really good to us. Um, they gave us probably more respect than anyone else um, from the psychiatric profession. And, um, you know, and basically that was there to, to keep her safe. So even though they were taking her away from us, which is always very traumatic, this even happened, you know, four, four, four years ago on Christmas Eve. It's still a very traumatic experience for me because it brings up a lot of um, bad memories. But um, the people who deal with her in that situation have always been really good and very understanding. When Joel was 12, there was a breakthrough that made things a little bit easier. His mum's family in Victoria discovered what was going on. Basically what happened was my mum is one of 11 children or was, was one of 11 children and, and my grandmother said this, you know, she, they didn't know what was going on. So they didn't have any idea that mum was going in psychiatric wards and stuff like that and we had no one really to care for us. So basically my grandma paid for my, my family because um, my mum wasn't paying the mortgage because she was just spending the money on other things and their relationship broke down and my uncle basically flew over, we chucked everything out the hand home pretty much, put everything in a car, drive my mum's car back to um, Warnell, Victoria, and then from then on every time when she went in, my grandmother or my family's relatives would look after us. Unbelievably, in the five years that Joel and his sister had been passed around different foster homes, no one, his dad included, had bothered to let Anne's family know to see if they could help. Well, that was that was the hardest thing. Um, you know, you'd think, you know, being being a father of your kid, you would want to come look after him, but he prioritised money and working in Saudi Arabia over his kids. So he knew that we were there and he just let us go to a foster home. And that was a very hard thing to reconcile, that you wouldn't just give up your job no matter what, you know, and come back. But, you know, he had to pay the mortgage and, and all that sort of stuff. And I can imagine for him it wouldn't have, you know, he it was very difficult for him being with my mum as it is. Um, so basically, you know, he took – he took the cow's way out, basically. He just stayed over there and used the excuse, I've got to pay the mortgage, I can't get a job in Australia, all that sort of thing. So that, that really hurt and it still hurts to this day. I, um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to um, mend the relationship with my dad who's a lot older now but still it's a very hard thing to, um, to reconcile in your mind or as a kid, you know, why doesn't my dad want to come and look after us? Um, that, that, that was very hard. As much as his father's abandonment hurt, the relief of having a stable home to go back to every time Anne needed a little bit of help made all the difference for Joel and his sister. Yeah, that was really good. Um, You know, they they helped us a lot and it just made things a lot easier. Um, You know, I don't know where I would have been if I kept going to a foster home or to friends, families in Perth, um, you know, until I was 18, I would have been off the rails a bit, I reckon. But having having a good, strong, extended family, um, just to know that they were there, um, that, and a really big family is, is, and caring one as well was, was really, really important. It's a big part of the reason Joel tells his story. He wants to change things for other kids in a similar situation. It's, it's something where, you know, I hold a lot of bitterness towards the whole psychiatric profession and human services. Even though it was the early 90s, I still think, you know, well, you know, if she's one of 11 children, surely you're going to know that somehow, maybe call her mum or something like that. Um, but, you know, to not have them really know about what was going on to the extent of what was going on was, was very disappointing because we could have had, you know, eight to 10 years or whatever it was where we had the actual family support around us rather than having to be not supported at all um, in that sort of place. And this is, this is something which would be commonplace. Um, I think the psychiatric profession, they don't know how to deal with the family unit at all. They don't know how to deal with young kids or young people who have a parent with a serious mental illness at all. We're always an afterthought, and I still think we're an afterthought in the whole thing. Um, I think they've got a long way to go in regards to how they treat children. Like, for example, you know, is it good for a child to go to a psychiatric ward to see their parent who's just electric shock treatment? Even though it might be good for the parent to, for their recovery who wants to see their kid, is that the long-term best thing for the child? You know, these are the sorts of things and the questions, and this still happens. It's not something that's, you know, back in the 90s. It's still happening to this day. We'll be right back after this short break. Once Joel became an adult, he left Warrnambool to move to Melbourne and began a degree. I had to move away from Warrnambool just to move away from mum was a really good thing for me to put distance between us. But my mum would call me five, four times a day. You know, I couldn't really get away from it. Um, and then there will always be dramas if she was in psych ward or there'll be something going on. And then, yeah, continued my uni up here, law commerce degree, whilst I got a job, and I've been at that job ever since. Um, so, yeah, I didn't. Really, I had to sort of figure it out myself. I didn't really have much guidance from her. You know, she sort of believed I could do whatever I want, which is, and I had an ultimate belief to me. But I never had her say, you know, I reckon you should do this, this, and this, and this. So it was more just a self discovery process, um, and then sort of trying to sort of deal with um, uh, the, the, tr- the child and sort of use that as fuel 
uh, to go on and do other things. While Anne's struggle with bipolar continued throughout her life, about five years ago, the universe threw her and the family yet another curveball. Um, she started declining probably five years ago. Um, you know, she's had so much electric shock treatment over the years and medication, and it was always going to happen. She was always going to decline, or her brain was going to decline at a quicker rate. So I took on the medical guardian role because she couldn't make decisions for herself, had to go to court for all that sort of stuff, and that was not a problem. But, yeah, no, it was very draining the last couple of years because um, she got diagnosed with a condition called progressive supranuclear palsy, which is a really rare brain disorder. And then basically within five months of that diagnosis, she was she passed away. So, you know, before that, she probably had it for at least a couple of years. And, um, you know, I had to make the tough call of putting her into a nursing home because she couldn't look after herself. And for anyone who's done that, they know how hard that is. She's losing her independence and stuff like that. But um, at least she was in a safe place. And then we had the pandemic. So the thing for me, she went in pretty normal to the nursing home. And then during the pandemic, I've... I couldn't see her and then I've come after the pandemic and seen I could see how much she's declined because of this condition. So, yeah, so I've had to take on a really big caring role in my later years. You can't – with the thing with having a parent with mental illness, you can't – you're never going to escape it. They're still your parent, you know, from, from childhood to until when they pass away. So there's always going to be issues with it. And then to take that on and to be there for her, especially in the last four weeks when she was made palliative, I was in a basically nursing home every day with my girlfriend. We just basically sat there for four weeks um, until she passed away. So to be able to do that for her was very important for me and something I'm very proud of. Finishing his degree was something Joel did as much to honour his mum as to build his own future. Well, funny enough, my my mum, I didn't really want to go to uni, but my mum wanted me to go to uni, so um, she didn't do... Um, you know, so I sort of thought, well, I've got to go to uni. I'm going to do what the highest degree I could, which was law. So I got into law, and then um, I basically really did it for her. And then before she passed away, I got my degree. It took me a long time to get my degree because I was doing it part time. And there's a picture of me when she's in a she's in a sort of wheelchair thing, and I've got my degree handing it to her. So before she passed away, I finished my degree and gave it to her. So I actually did it for her. I really didn't do it for myself. These days, as well as working full time, Joel hosts a mental health podcast called Lived Experience. It's focused on building awareness for other people, particularly children and young people, who might have similar experiences to his own. There's a lot of mental health awareness, which is fantastic, but it seems to be all around depression and anxiety. There's a lot more mental health issues besides depression and anxiety. And I sort of think that the narrative regarding mental health is just focused on those two areas. There's no real public, there's no real awareness around bipolar, schizophrenia, BPD, anorexia, and especially young carers, you know, kids who have a parent with a mental illness, even though it's a really prevalent issue, right? You know, you've got more than, you know, you've got more than one, 1.5 or some people put it 2% of people in the population who have bipolar and they will have families and kids, right? So this is something that we don't really hear about often enough. And the goal of the podcast is just basically to create some awareness or share some stories around around what I went through, but also around what other people have experienced. And it's very similar. You know, I've had people on who have had a who had a parent with a serious mental illness and the same thing they went through in regards to feeling left out by the system and and not being respected by the, the, the people who are treating their parents and all that sort of stuff. And it's a very common theme. So it's about can we get some awareness, can we get some attention and some money most importantly to these organizations, you know, like Bipolar Australia, like Satellite, like Little Dreamers, who look after young carers or to help people with bipolar more because that's for me where the inroads can be made. One area Joel would love to see more support is with the responsibility placed on young shoulders when kids have a parent or parents with severe mental health conditions. He says often it's kids at the front line without the right kind of education or help. You're the first point of call for suicide prevention because, you know, there's there's occasions where I'd have a fight with my mum and she'd say things like, well, you know, when I come back, I'm not going to be here, I'm going to kill myself. You know, like you're on the first point of call and then you've got to sort of work at is that an attention, call for attention or is she going to really do it or these sorts of things. So that's that's stuff that kids and young people and, and even older people are put into positions on a daily basis yet what's the support for them, where's the awareness for them. You know, this is, this is the sort of stuff that a lot of people go through. Despite the heartbreaking experiences Joel went through as a child, he has nothing but love and understanding for his mum and he sees his past as fuel for a brighter future. Um, but I think, I think with a lot of kids who have a parent with a serious mental illness, the one thing we all have is we have resilience. You know, we're exposed to a lot of extreme trauma and situations from a very young age, and you don't know it in the moment. But you've got, you're, you're being exposed to all these really traumatic things, and you're surviving, and you're getting through them. And mentally, you've got to be really strong, or you just crumble at school. So you just have this resilience and this toughness inbuilt into your situation, which a lot of people don't get. And then as you get a bit older, you look back and go, well. 
if I can get through that, I can get through this. So any situation I come across now moving forward in life, whether it be work or with family or any issue, it's, it's, in, it's a really small issue compared to what I've already been through. So it's just using those moments or those, those things I've gone through and reminding myself, well, I've got through that. This is nothing in comparison to that. And I haven't really ever faced a challenge that was bigger than the one recently with um, my mum being in palliative care and having to be by someone you love for four weeks in a bed whilst they're dying in front of you. Um, you know, there'll be nothing ever harder than that I have to experience. So using those sort of situations in fuel and just remembering when I need to call on that sort of stuff, um, that the stuff that I do face, which people might think is hard, let it say at work or whatever, it, it just had a bit of perspective and it's, it's not really hard at all. A massive thank you to Joel for joining us and sharing his story. And if you have ever found yourself in a situation you swear you never could have predicted, we want to hear all about it. You can email us at isin at news.com.au. Nina and I also hang out over on Insta. You can find us at ISIN Podcast and give us a follow. Please, please give us a follow. We're going to be back next week with another episode and I hope your life is filled with only good things until then. So there you have it, my interview on the I Swear I Never podcast. A big thank you to Beck Day for taking an interest in the story and having me on and also to Tess Lazarus for organising that opportunity. I really appreciate the pro bono work she's doing in the background for the podcast. She's landed me a couple of great stories here. She's from Invigorate PR, so a big thank you to Tess Lazarus and great, great person not to have on your team. Um, you know, and look, you know, even though th- th- that was might sound a bit depressing to you, like end of the day, I lived through it. Um, I'm, I'm quite happy and um, I wouldn't change my experience for anything. I wouldn't change my mum for anything. I can tell you that right now. You know, I used to wish that I could, but looking back on it now, you know, she was a, she was a great person. And um, I'm happy to talk about that thing because I know, you know, I can on those episodes, I can sort of tell and remind people if you didn't know her, you know, how, how great of a mother she was and how much I loved her. So that's why I do it. I don't mean to disparage her in, in any way. I'm just telling an honest opinion of a, of a well-known fact and a well-known scenario um, that, that, that doesn't really get as much attention in the mental health media or awareness movement that is going on currently, which is great. Um, however, as you heard in the episode, needs to, more needs to be done around young carers and, and kids and if you have a mental uh, parent with a mental illness and also bipolar and schizophrenia. So that's the reason why I do it. And I hope you got a bit out of it. And once again, big thank you to Tess and Beck Day uh, for their inclusion. If you haven't done so already, please make sure you leave a review on the iTunes or on the website or on Spotify. It really does help. And also, if you want to send me an email just to even maybe come on the show yourself, if you've got a, I'm really after young carriers or older people who've had a parent with a mental illness, that's what I really want to focus on. So if you have had that situation, please reach out via my contact form and I'm more than happy to have you on. So until next episode, please stay safe and I hope you have a great week.